thank you, Rusty and Barbara. I remember where I was the first time I heard that song. It was meant to it was from quite a few years ago. It has marked me. Uh, that song is it's anointed. Well, is, I hope everyone's all right this morning. Ready for a little Bible study? We're uh, Okay, I wanted to announce to you this morning, uh, this will be, it's, obviously it's our last week on the book of Acts, we're going to be on chapter 28 this morning, if you want to go on and turn there in your Bible. Uh, starting next week, I'm going to do a series on the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. We've historically tried to uh, do a New Testament book and then an Old Testament book, alternate, and uh I've wanted to do Daniel for a long time, and uh, I'm excited about it and looking forward to it. It's a very special book. It's got a lot for us in there. So, but oh yes, the, re the reason I said that, uh, Daniel's chapters are very verbose, and they're lengthy, and it's a little bit more than I could put into your handout, as we've done in the past. So I would like to encourage you to bring your Bible, uh, it'll be much easier. I'm going to put as much study material into your handout as I can. Fill it up, but it's going to be too much to put the long text of Dan Daniel in there. So bring your Bibles. We're, we're people of the book, right? We're Baptist people here. All right. Well, as we left off last week, Paul's ship had run aground on an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It turned out that island was the little island of Malta. They crashed. The ship broke up out on the rocks offshore, and everybody had to jump ship and swim to shore. And they, it says that they did that by holding on to boards and pieces of wreckage. And uh, 276 passengers on that boat, plus the crew, uh, not one soul was lost, just like God prophesied. They all made it to the beach. Uh, it was raining, it was cold. They built a fire. Paul picked up a, a bunch of twigs and branches to carry up, throw on the fire. And when he did, there was a viper snake in there, bidding, hung on to it. Uh, he shook it off, it says, into the fire. And all the Islanders from Malta were sitting there in the log watching that, and they all said, let's hang on a minute and watch, watch. He's going to drop dead here in just a minute. And nothing ever happened to Paul, so Amen. divine intervention there. Three months they spent on that little island, three months uh, of waiting and hoping, and sure enough, a ship came and docked at Malta that they could get aboard. Now, I don't know about the 276, but I know Paul and his little company could. So that's what it says in verse 11 for us. They had been there three months and they sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the tw twin brothers which had wintered at the island. So this ship had, had been there all winter long too, this three months that Paul was there. This ship was from Alexandria, which is Egypt. And more than likely what's going on here this was a ship that was a grain ship. They, uh, you might not know this or not, but if it had not been for Egypt, the Roman Empire never would have existed as it was at Paul's time because Egypt was literally the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. Vast quantities of wheat and barley were raised in Egypt and carried up to Rome and it fed the Romans. So they're on a grain ship and he mentions little detail about the ship's not real important. He says it's got the twin brothers as a figurehead. Now, probably some of y'all have seen those old Viking ships. Have you ever seen that? And out on the front of the ship, it's got a mean looking dragon or something like that. Well, that's what he's talking about here. Up on the bow of the boat, there was a tw figurehead of the twin brothers. Uh, doesn't mean anything to us. It did to the people that lived back then. The, the figurehead represented Castor and Pollux. Yes. 
Never heard of them before I studied this lesson. They, as it, turn, <clears throat> as it turns out, are from the constellation Gemini. Okay, and I didn't know that either. The two brightest stars in Gemini in the sky are Castor and Pollux. Now, that's all well and good, and I'm glad somebody had the foresight to name a couple of bright stars. The problem is, in Roman times, these two twin brothers were an idol that were, was worshipped, yeah. uh, which we know did not fly with early Christianity. As a matter of fact, Paul in Acts 27, when we were there a week or two ago, he makes a specific point to tell all the sailors, I worship the God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. Remember that? In other words, we don't isolate little local stars, moons, or suns, or anything else. We worship the invisible, spiritual, omnipotent creator of everything. Amen. So I don't know if Paul kept his mouth shut uh, on this voyage with those two idols up there in the bow of the boat. He, knowing Paul, he probably had something to say about it. It's not recorded for us in Scripture. Well, it says in 15 that from Rome, uh, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Abbey Forum and Three Ends. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. So here it is. He finally lands in Italy. This has been a long process. It's been three years since he was in Caesarea and he told uh, Agrippa, King Agrippa, Agrippa, that he appealed to go to the court of Caesar, which is in Rome, Italy. He was imprisoned in Caesarea for two and a half years. He was a year on this voyage trying to get back up there to Rome. So verse 15 marks the, the landing, if you will. It's on, the, it's on the west coast of Italy. It's about 50 miles from Rome. So they're on solid ground again. And when he docks, a blessing takes place. The blessing takes place that uh, took place is that he was met by a group of Christians from Rome. And they had made the journey, they had walked it out to go from Rome down here to the three ends. And it's about 45 to 50 mile little walk there for you. Uh, they came, and then, you know, when I saw that, I, I thought, it made me ponder. I wondered. I had to go look and find out what was the chronology. But where, where did these Christians come from that came from Rome to meet Paul when the boat pulled up? Well, as it turns out, and I didn't know this. Maybe you knew this. The Book of Romans was written three years before this. I didn't know that. I thought it came after Paul got to Rome. It didn't. And so, evidently. Christians had established a church in Rome very early. We're talking about probably 60 AD, 61 AD. It was 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. Christianity had moved from Jerusalem all the way to the Roman Empire. That's pretty impressive. You know, I think if Paul, in looking back at the three years previous, uh, he had told them in the book of Rome, Romans that he wanted to come see them. He had, he had never been there before. He didn't start that church. And I have questions. Where did these people come from and how did they start that church there in Rome? And it turns out, if we go back to Acts chapter 2, our book that we've been studying, on the day of Pentecost, it lists all the nations that were present there when the Spirit fell like tongues of fire. And there were Romans there. It seems clear that what happened was that day of Pentecost when 3,000 people were saved is that some of them went back to Rome. They were Christians and they began to witness and evangelize. And what transpired was a church was planted in Rome. Amen. 16, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier 
who guarded him. So this ship had 276 people on it. We don't know how many of them were prisoners. Might have been a good number of them. However, after the march from the three ends on the west coast of Italy to Rome, Paul gets special consideration because it tells us they delivered the prisoners to a centurion guard, but Paul was set apart, he was isolated, and he was to, permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier that guarded him. So the picture is Paul was able to rent a house in Rome, it was house arrest. And to, just like today, when we, uh, oftentimes we'll uh, release somebody from jail and we'll put an ankle monitor on them, keep tabs of where they're at. Paul had a Roman soldier from the Praetorian Guard that was chained to him. Now, how, how can we, can you imagine that? I mean, have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about 24 hours a day being chained to somebody? I mean, it would be so inconvenient. Absolutely zero privacy. Feel sorry for the guard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm going to that because it's very evident. Oh, by the way, these guards, these Praetorians, for house arrest in Rome at that time, their shift was four hours. All right? So we've got six soldiers today that are being chained to Paul for two years. What do you think happened? <laughs> You're right. I'm going to read the verse for you in just a minute. It's a remarkable story because Amen. Paul tells us that the name of Jesus is known throughout yes. the Praetorian Guard and throughout the household of Caesar. So these, these men, these uh, Gentile, Roman, uh, super centurions were being led to Christ, being chained to this man. The Praetorian Guard, if you don't know, is a unit, an elite unit of the Roman military. It was composed of up to 10,000 centurions, I mean of uh, legionnaires. It was the most elite, decorated military unit in the Roman Empire. Their personal responsibility was to guard the emperor. And Paul being there, wanted to have a court session with the emperor. He, he's leading the Praetorian Guard to Christ. Let me read for you Philippians 1.13. He says, My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Amen. He didn't keep his mouth shut. He testified to these soldiers. Now, there might have been some of them that were a little crusty. They might have rattled his chain and told him to shut up. But evidently, that's not the case with all of them. I think that Paul led a great number of them to the Lord. Verse 30, it says, Paul dwelt two whole years in his rented house, and he received everybody that came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. All right, so he's got another two years. You know, you appeal to Caesar, you've got three years of Caesarea and on the sea voyage, now you've got another two years of waiting. It's been a long, extended period of time. But the years were not wasted. What is it, two years? You know what he did in those two years? It's interesting because we know what he did. He wrote the prison epistles yes. of the New Testament, books that you've got right there in your Bibles. He was welcoming, welcoming everybody that came to him. That tells us he had an open door in his house situation. He was able to have Luke and other Christians come and minister to him. We also know that Jewish Leaders came and listened to him. We know that just the Christian church people of that time, they came to visit with him during those two years. So he was not alone. Now, I mentioned he wrote the prison epistles. That would be Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. He wrote those four books while he was imprisoned in Rome. 
This is around 61 AD. Have you ever heard of Tertullian, one of the church fathers, Tertullian? He lived in 155 to 220 AD, North Africa, Carthage. And I, I, this is kind of out of context, but I just want to read a little paragraph from him to tell you. And I hope you appreciate uh, that in 30 years, from 12 blue collar apostles in the city of Jerusalem, in 30 years, Christianity had reached the capital of the Roman Empire. The churches were established by this man Paul in eight different countries. He circulated everywhere through Asia Minor all the way to Europe in 30 years. This is what Tertullian said about the spread of Christianity. He says, and yet we have filled every place belonging to you. He's writing this to the emperor. We have filled your cities, your islands, your castles, your towns, your assemblies, your very camp, your tribes, your companies, your palace, your senate, and your forum. We leave you only your temples. We can count your armies and our numbers in a single province are greater. Yes. That's 30 years. It's an amazing testimony to the early Christian church and their uh, willingness to evangelize. Now, as I said last week, this is just something to file away as you read your New Testament. This imprisonment is Paul's first trip to Rome. He evidently gets to see Nero, Caesar, and is released. And he goes out and evangelizes some more. That's when he wrote first and second Timothy and Titus. He goes back, he gets arrested again the second time, and he goes back to Rome under arrest. This is around 67, 68 AD. And this time, this time he's convicted by, by Caesar. This time he is led outside the city walls and beheaded. I want to do something a little different now at this point. As we finish the book of Acts, as I finished the book of Acts, I, I had a pretty intense uh, time of uh, meditation or uh, inspiration or just realization of what I just got through reading in the book of Acts about this man, this apostle Paul the life story of Paul. And it, it led me back to, I guess, my roots and possibly your roots about why and how was this one man able to change the world. Only Jesus. It is. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. And if you'll permit me, I would like to share the gospel with you. I know many of you are Christians, if not all, but I want to do it anyway. I want to do it because I need it. I need to hear it over and over again, that old story. And it, it has edified me to consider that this story of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what turned the life of Paul around. It took a bitter, murderous, traitorous, Killed him, like Paul, and turned him into what is considered by most to be the greatest missionary that has ever lived, Amen. except Jesus. So allow me, here is, here is the gospel. This is what motivated Paul. John 1 12 says, As many as have received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to all those that believe on his name. Let me say, that verse by John explains to us two things. Number one, it explains that people can receive Jesus and it explains that in doing so they become children of God. And so we ask, what is it to receive Jesus? We talk to people all the time. 
They'll say, oh, well, I've been to church or I've been baptized and my mom and dad were Christians. This verse explains what receiving Jesus is. It is to those that believe in his name. Believers, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ receive something. They become something they were not. It clearly tells us those that receive him, he gave the right to become what? To become children of God. In other words, they were not before. They were alive, they had a human existence, but they were not children of God. The reason I emphasize this is because this world that we live in, it, it likes to celebrate what is called the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That's the worldly pagan philosophy of our world, and it's wrong. It is taught nowhere in the Holy Scriptures. It was Jesus himself that told us, he was talking to some Jewish leaders one day, that thought that because they were of the, the blood of Abraham, that they were God's children. And he said to them, you are of your father, the devil, not children of Abraham, not children of God. Shocking. They believed, being children of Abraham, that their salvation was secured. It was not. And more shocking than that, listen to me, more shocking than that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, you are, of the, you are children of the devil. Yes. Now, you know, those men standing there that day, they were Jewish leaders. They were members probably of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. They were men that studied the scripture all day. They went, to, they went to the temple. They went to synagogue, tried to obey the law of God. And Jesus says, they are children of the devil. What does that mean? Why is that true? How could that happen? How could it even be true? Well, John 3.16 tells us that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know that verse, don't you? Amen. That's, that's a verse from childhood. That's a verse that early as I can remember. I knew John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gave. That's all I want to say. I want to say gave. Gave means that God the Father sent his only begotten son to this world, and it doesn't mean that that is the giving. The giving is the death of Jesus Christ on a Roman cross as the substitute for my sin. Yes. That is what God the Father did when he sent Jesus. He sent him to die. That whosoever believes in him, all right, Whoever believes in Jesus, believe. This is not anything that's like anything at all like intellectual understanding. The book of James tells us that even demons believe in Jesus and they tremble. No, what this belief is, is to place your faith in, your trust in, your confidence in him for your very life. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now notice this. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. What does that mean? What does it mean? Perish. Does, I mean, you might say, well, all of us are going to die. We're all going to perish. But that's not what it means. You'd be incorrect if you thought that. It does not mean physical death. It does not mean that your soul will be extinguished when you die, that you will no longer exist. No. Perish in the scriptures refers to the fact that you are spiritually going to die and spend eternity in hell. Hell, separated from God. The degree of hell you're in will be based upon your life and acts. There are degrees in hell, but nonetheless, it is hell. Yes, sir. And there's no hope there. That they should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's the, here's the gateway right here. 
You have a choice. All of us have a choice. I have a choice. We can either perish or we can have everlasting life. Everlasting life is, it's, it's called in some places the life of the ages, the life of the blessed. It is not referring primarily to the fact of eternity. Here's the truth for you. The Bible teaches that every soul that has ever been conceived and born in this world has eternal life in the sense of time. All of us are going to live forever. We're either going to live in heaven or we're going to live in hell. When he says that they receive eternal life for believing in Jesus, he's not giving them life in the sense of time. He's giving them eternal life right now, the blessed life of salvation in Jesus living in our hearts right now. Amen. So you have to ask yourself after these two verses, should I do anything about this? Is there something I should do? John 3.36 says it. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know what wrath is. All right, I don't need to explain that. So you might say, if I don't believe in Jesus, the wrath of God abides on me. Why is the wrath of God abiding on me? Because what have I ever done? Why? The answer is in the scriptures. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And once again, you might say, but I've never done that. I'm a pretty good person. I'm sure better than that person. I'm better than a lot of people I've read about. The point is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the way you check that is to ask yourself the question, have you ever disobeyed your parents and not honored them? Have you ever murdered anyone? And you say, no, Jesus said, if you've ever had anger in your heart toward another, you've committed murder. Have you ever lusted? Have you ever had thoughts about a man or a woman that was not yours? You say, no, I've never done that. I've never committed adultery. The Bible says, Jesus said, if you've even thought about it, you've done it. Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever took anything from work that wasn't yours or school? Have you ever lied? Have you ever told a lie to mom or dad or anybody? Have you ever wanted something that was somebody else's? You coveted something? Have you ever used the name of Jesus as an exclamation or a pro profane word? Have you ever done that? Do you have any idols? You might not have a statue, but have you ever put ultimate belief in politics, in entertainment, in money, in power, in status? Those are idols. And finally, the last Ten Commandments is, have you ever had any other God other than Jehovah God? And that includes yourself. Have you ever placed ultimate meaning in yourself? That you are the captain of your soul? That you are the decision maker? That life is up to you? Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does that mean? Amen. The wages, the wages of sin, the, think of a paycheck, if you will. You work 40 hours a week and you get a paycheck for it. You sin and you get death. That's the scripture's proclamation right there. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That's another one, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let that sink in. Never forget it. Never, never stop appreciating the fact that while you were still a sinner, probably weren't even thinking about God, you were sinning against him, you were going your own way. At that specific point in time, 
God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sin. Amen. He loved you so much. 1 John 5, 11, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who, who, he who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. My question is, do you have the Son? Yes. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. Second point, do you know that you're going to heaven? Do you know that you have eternal life? Are you positive? Are you sure? I do. And it's not because of anything about me. It's because of that scripture right there. John said, these things I have written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know. Amen. He wants you to have assurance. He wants you to be confident at rest, not wrestling over that fact. If you have the Son, you have life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. John 10, 27. I'll close with this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Amen. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. First thing, do you hear his voice? My sheep hear my voice, he says. Do you hear his voice? Are you guided through your life by hearing the shepherd's voice? Do you hear him calling you this morning, today, to accept him, to believe on him, to put your faith, confidence, and trust in him? That's what he does. Yes. He's a shepherd, and he calls his sheep. Would you place yourself in the shepherd's hands? That's the question the scripture asks there. It's a simple question. Will you allow yourself by faith and belief, trusting in Christ, place yourself in his hands to be kept safely for all eternity? That's the promise that we have as Christian people. I'd like to close with a prayer. I'd like to close with a prayer that you might follow along with me in your heart and say it silently. But it's a prayer to receive Christ as I started out with in John 1, 12. It's a prayer that says to God that I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I ask for his salvation today. I'm going to say this prayer out loud if there's any. This is a good prayer even, by the way, for a Christian. Someone that's born again. But it's a prayer, if you don't know Christ, to say today. Dear Heavenly Father, by listening to your scripture, I realize that I have sinned. I have broken some of the Ten Commandments. I, I have committed sins in my life against you. Likewise, from the Bible, Lord, the scriptures I've just heard, I realize that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross for me. He died for me because I sinned. And he took my sin and put it on himself, and he died death on that cross. And so right now, Lord, I want to turn away from my sin and myself and this world, and I turn to you. Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me, to forgive me, to take away my sin. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. 
and live in my heart forever. I pray and ask for a home in heaven. Lord Jesus, I pray to live for you the rest of my life. I realize from the word of God that you are Lord, omnipotent, omniscient. You are God. And I want to surrender to you. I ask you to allow me to be born again and to become a child of God as I receive you now, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.